Mike asked if I would teach on deconstructing dispensationalism. And I guess that's a good word for it, deconstructing, because dispensationalism is a construct. It's a theological construct. It's a framework through which Bible theology is interpreted and, uh, and the Bible is read through the lens of, uh, of this construct by very, very many Christians. Uh, in fact, I would say that when I first uh, really became a student of eschatology, and this is not just an eschatological system, but it is, it's, it's in eschatology that we usually discover dispensationalism first. Uh, when I began to study, uh, eschatology originally, I, I never knew there was anything other than dispensationalism. In fact, I didn't know the word dispensationalism. Probably you didn't either. Uh, many people say, well, what's that? Well, it turns out they dispensationalists always have been, but never knew the name of it. My teachers never said, okay, this view is the dispensational view. They just said, this is what the Bible teaches. And since dispensationalism is so broadly taught by uh, evangelicals in America, especially, it was a pretty good chance you would hear almost everyone on the radio, almost every uh, preacher in, a say, a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a non-denominational church would be uh, taking this position, if they happen to be speaking, on the subject of uh, end times or of Israel or any subject like that. And so... I actually never heard any other view. And uh, my view changed only by my own study of the scripture, just one at a time. These pieces of this puzzle began to uh, be, I had to reject them. My pastor at the time had said, and he gave this counsel from the pulpit, that as you read through the Bible, you will find things that don't seem to fit your understanding, but don't worry about that. Don't stop reading. Just uh, put those aside for the time being, as it were, put them in a drawer in your head and uh, and just keep reading. And in time, uh, things will become more clear. And this was certainly true as I would read through the Bible in my teenage years. My late teenage years is when I began to teach. And I was teaching dispensationalism, though I didn't know that's what it was. As I would study my Bible, and I did a great deal. I, in fact, I studied, I read my Bible whenever I could, whenever there wasn't something else I had to be doing. I was reading my Bible. Over the years, I did begin to see things that were like, puzzle pieces that didn't seem to fit uh, the overall picture I had of Scripture. There were verses that just didn't seem to agree with it. But like my teacher had told me to do, just put them back in the shelf of your of your mind and don't worry about it, just keep studying. Well, eventually I had so many puzzle pieces in my drawer that I thought, I wonder why there would be so many pieces and so many things in Scripture that didn't fit what I thought the Bible generally was teaching. And then I began to pull those out and look at them. And I realized that I was working on a different puzzle, that the, the pieces that I had in my drawer made a different picture. And then when I began to see that other picture, and this took some years for me, at least uh, between four and six years of my own study, I was teaching dispensationalism, but beginning to find problems of various sorts. But eventually I had enough pieces in that drawer to begin the construction of another picture. And then I began to see that the whole Bible, uh, for my, to my mind, read more smoothly and more reasonably through this other picture. And I didn't realize until later that someone told me that what I had been taught and had been teaching was called dispensationalism. I didn't know there was a name for the new picture I was seeing. In fact, I wasn't sure if anyone else had seen that picture before because I never met anyone who taught it or I'd never read a book about it. But once I had changed my view, I had come over to what I guess would be called, I guess it's it's kind of like the covenantal view. I don't use that term for it. Uh, my eschatological views I would call amillennial. And I didn't know that was what it was called. Uh, someone had to tell me that that's what it was called after I'd already become one because I'd never encountered it. In fact, like I said, I thought I was the only person who had thought these things. And I was so, I was actually afraid to speak them, but until I found out, that this is what the church had taught through most of its history. And then I became less shy about speaking out what my views were. So the dispensational view is a relatively new view. It is, I'm going to cover four things here. I'm going to talk about the history, and I'm going to try to cover this as quickly as I can. The history of dispensationalism, 
Then I'm going to talk about three of the distinctives of dispensationalism. There may be more, but these are the ones, the big ones, that set dispensationalism apart from other viewpoints. The first distinctive is their view of a literal interpretation of the Bible. The second is going to be on the distinction between Israel and the church, as they understand that. And the third is going to be on their eschatology, which has some distinctives that no, that, that the church wasn't teaching before dispensationalism arose. And when was that? Well, that's where, what we come to first, the history. Where did dispensationalism come from? Almost everyone agrees that the system called dispensationalism began with a man named John Nelson Darby around the year 1830. Now, from time to time, you'll find people objecting to this suggestion. They're saying, no, Darby didn't start this. This was taught by some of the church fathers. I have had the pleasure, actually, of reading a couple of books. One is called Dispensationalism Before Darby, and one was called Ancient Dispensational Truths. And both of these books try to point out that there was a lot of elements of dispensationalism were around before Darby formulated them. In fact, some of the earliest church fathers, including Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Hippolytus, were uh, they, they weren't dispensationalists by any means. And, and even these books say they weren't. These are written by dispensationalist authors. And they're trying to prove that dispensationalism wasn't a novel thing in 1830 when Darby came up with it. But they do admit these guys they're quoting from earlier were not dispensationalists in the sense that we think of the term today. But they did have some ideas similar to dispensationalism. Now, we have to understand that when it comes to the church fathers and and then the later church uh, theologians, they're in all kinds of different camps. I mean, the church fathers didn't all agree about things. Uh, they did agree uh, in many cases on things that most of us would reject. In fact, they dis- they agreed with each other on things that dispensationalists reject. For example, infant baptism. A lot of the church fathers believe in infant baptism. Most dispensationalists don't. So you're going to find that the, there's no consensus among the earlier church teachers on these matters. But what Darby did, Darby was part of a movement called the Plymouth Brethren, which was kind of a radical breakaway from establishment church. He was an Anglican scholar, really, very intelligent man. He made his own translation of the Bible. The Darby translation is still available on many of the Bible apps where you've got several translations. The Darby translation is there. He wrote many theology books, and he formulated the system of beliefs that are called dispensationalism today. They were also called Darbyism because of his name, Darby. Uh, in fact, in the early days, it wasn't called dispensationalism. It was called Darbyism. And the people who followed it were called Darbyites. And I didn't know this until just uh, the other day. An author that I really like named Philip Morrow seems to have been the one who coined the term dispensationalism. He didn't believe in it. He wrote a book against it called, uh, I think it was called The Gospel of the Kingdom. And in it, he critiqued dispensationalism, but I didn't realize that he was, uh, he's considered the first back in the 1920s to actually give it the name dispensationalism. Before that, it was Plymouth Brethrenism or it was uh, Darbyism and it had other names. Today, everyone knows it by the term dispensationalism. Now it's called that because the word dispensations refers in, in his system to periods of time distinct periods of time where God was testing his people by various tests. There are they, they believe there were seven dispensations and that each one had a different test. Now, this is interesting to get into, but I'm not going to get into it because uh, because the, the existence of dispensations is not really that controversial. From the earliest days, the church fathers spoke about the Old Testament dispensation as distinguished from the New Testament dispensation. That was generally the way they used the word dispensation. It was like a period of time in the Old Testament as opposed to a period of time in the New Testament. Darby had uh, the dispensations broken up into seven distinct ones. Five of them were in the Old Testament. I won't go into them right now because it's not the main things I want to discuss, and I'm, I'd, I'd soon run out of time. But Darby is the one who is the father of the system. And uh, I- even if some elements that he incorporated were known to have been taught by some people before him, and even maybe a few of them, even in the church fathers or or something like it in the church fathers. He put this together as a system, and it's his baby, and and frankly, all church historians agree with this. Now, Darby was in England, but it's probably 
in the 20th century, America became the main distributor of dispensationalism to the church worldwide. In America, there's a man named James Inglis, I-N-G-L-I-S, who put out a magazine in the late 1800s, from 1854 to uh, 1872. This man, James Inglis, put out a magazine called Waymarks in the Wilderness in America. And this was widely read, and it began to uh, have an influence on many evangelicals in the country. And D.L. Moody, who was a very famous evangelist, uh, picked up these ideas. And he lived from 1837, which, of course, he was born around the time Darby's views were becoming popular in England, but Moody was American. But from 1837 to 1899, uh, Moody uh, tended to popularize this viewpoint. And some other people much less rec- known than him, one named James H. Brooks, in 1876 began something called the Niagara Bible Conference Movement at Niagara Falls, uh, up in actually Ontario and, and upper New York State. And they had these conferences every year except for one from uh, 1876 to 1897. And these conferences were attended by leading evangelical pastors and interested parties, scholars, and so forth. And they basically promoted the dispensational view in Amer- on American soil. The big break that dispensationalism got in America was the Schofield Reference Bible. In 1909, a lawyer named Cyrus Schofield put out a Bible with notes in it. It was considered to be controversial in some by by non dispensationalists because it was the first time somebody had decided to write his theological positions on the same page with the scriptures and put them in the Bible and call it the Bible. Now, of course, Schofield didn't claim that his own notes at the bottom of the page were scripture, but I mean, they didn't have all these study Bibles we have now. We have lots of study Bibles now. There's probably dozens of them. And in each of them, someone writes their explanations and notes and so forth at the bottom of the page of a Bible page. And, and so you can go through the whole Bible and read somebody's commentaries on it. Well, that's what Schofield did in 1909. And he did so specifically to uh, spread the uh, dispensationalist viewpoint. And uh, his Bible sold like crazy. I think three million copies sold really early on. There are lots of Christians who carry the Schofield Bible. I, I actually wore out four Schofield Bibles uh, when I was young. I actually wore the covers off of them. And they were not bad covers. I just I used them so much. My pastor at the time, Chuck Smith, was using the Schofield Bible. It was the dispensational Bible, the go-to Bible for dispensational teaching, uh, Schofield Bible. Now, of course, there's been quite a few other study Bibles put out. Most of them are put out by dispensationalists. Not everyone. There's a few out there that are not put out by dispensationalists, but most of them are. And I suspect that the reason is because if you want to promote dispensationalism, then what you don't want to do is let people read the Bible for themselves. You need to put the notes in there. If you just read the Bible yourself, you won't get the dispensational ideas out of it, because in my opinion, they're not there. But if if they're in the notes at the bottom of the page, then of course the notes can tell you how to look at the passage in a dispensational way. And that's what Schofield's Bible did, and many, many study Bibles do today. A very important event in the promotion of dispensationalism in America was the establishment of the uh, Evangelical Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. A man named Lewis Berry Chafer started this in 1924, and it became Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, Most of you may have heard of Dallas Theological Seminary. Almost all radio preachers have gone there. Uh, Almost all prophecy writers have gone there. It was established to promote dispensationalism, and it did a great job of it. Uh, John Walvoord, uh, Charles Ryrie, Dwight Pentecost were among the names of people who were professors there. Later on, Hal Lindsey, who wrote The Late Great Planners, was a a graduate of there. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, more recently, uh, was chancellor there at Dallas. Uh, It's hard to find a person who ever writes or speaks on prophecy who didn't ever go to Dallas Theological Seminary or or at least read commentators by those who did. 
I don't know if you can still find Christian bookstores. Everyone buys online now, but I used to go into Christian bookstores all the time and to the commentary section. And I'd pull a commentary off the shelf. I'd read on the back who the author was. And I don't think I ever pulled one off the shelf where the author hadn't gotten his doctorate or his master's or some part of his education at Dallas Theological Seminary. J. Vernon McGee was a professor at D Dallas Theological Seminary. I mean, so some very influential people in the, in Christian media and writers on the subject of prophecy studied at Dallas. And that's what Dallas was for. It was, it was there to teach people to promote dispensationalism. I mentioned that Hal Lindsey, uh, had gone there. If you don't know who he is in 1970, he put out a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was the, the greatest popularization of dispensationalism to have ever come out up to that point in 1970. By 1990, over 28 million copies of the late great planet Earth had sold almost 30 million copies in the first 20 years. And it's, I think it's still in print. It did predict some things that couldn't possibly come true on the timeline that he suggested, but I think he modifies the book and puts out new editions once in a while. But he was like the, 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 the most successful popularizer of dispensational ideas out there. And his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, it was not his only book, but it was his first and it was his most successful. Uh, it eventually sold many, many millions, tens of millions of copies, of course. Then, uh, in the early seventies also, there was some movies came out. It, many of you may not be old enough to remember these. Some of you will. In 1972, a movie came out called The Thief in the Night. And it, it was followed by two sequels. One was called A Distant Thunder and one was called All the King's Men. These were low budget movies that came out based on the dispensational timeline. Basically, the, the, the idea of the story was some people had missed the rapture. And so it depicts their, the horrors of their life in the tribulation. It might sound familiar if you read the Left Behind series. Well, this was long before the Left Behind series. This was back in the early 70s. And over 300 million people saw those movies. That's, you know, back then that was probably more than the population of the United States. 300 million people saw those movies. They were very poorly made, but, you know, everyone was interested in the end times and that's what they portrayed supposedly from a dispensational point of view. So that was in the early 70s, but by the end of the 70s, by 1979, Jerry Falwell and Tim LaHaye started something called the Moral Majority. And one of their main reasons for starting it was to push for American support of the state of Israel. Now, this was based on their dispensational understanding of the importance of Israel in the last days. And the Moral Majority wasn't just about Israel, but it was a politically active movement. And uh, Jerry Falwell was a pastor, and Tim LaHaye, I think he was not a pastor. I think he, he might have been a pastor. Right? He was mainly an author. I knew of his works from years earlier. But that moral majority made a big splash. And then, starting 1995 to the year 2007, we begin to have a stream of left-behind books, altogether 16 of them. Tim LaHaye, the co-founder of The Moral Majority, and uh, his ghostwriter named Jerry Jenkins wrote these 16 books, which made gazillions of dollars and were widely, they, they were best-selling books. They were novels. And they they were based on, again, the idea of missing the rapture and ending up in the tribulation. It's interesting. These were fat books, and there were 16 of them. I remember looking at them, even at one of them, thinking, well, they've got like 500 pages here written based on the book of Revelation, which only has 20 pages. You know, and that was book one. You know, I mean, it's like you wonder how how much speculation is in those books. So there must have been I, I, the total number of pages must have been in the uh, maybe tens of thousands. I don't know of that whole series of books. But Revelation is only about 20 pages long. And that's what they're basing it on. So it's almost all speculation, of course. Now, frankly, Left Behind gave a new generation a fascination with dispensational schemes of the end times. But also in the academy, that is in the evangelical scholarly world, dispensationalism about that time began to be viewed more or less as a sensationalistic view. 
even among dispensationalists, there was a, a, a desire on the part of many to distance themselves from some of the uh, what just seemed to be hokey or uh, just imbalanced dispensational ideas that were out there. So there was, in the 1990s, three men, I think one of them only was from Dallas Theological Seminary. I don't remember where the other two guys were. They were uh, Craig A. Blazing, Daryl Bach, and Robert L. Saucy. They began a movement called Progressive Dispensationalism. Now, Progressive dispensationalism is still dispensationalism. They still hold to most of the tenets of dispensationalism. Uh, they're not so insistent on the pre-trib rapture as classic dispensationalism is, but they they still have the strong other elements. And we're going to talk about what those elements are in a moment. I'm just going through the history of it right now. They began to kind of walk back a little bit a few of the things that were the most irresponsible claims made by dispensationalists, and that, that movement still exists, but it's still dispensationalist. It's just an attempt to kind of, I don't know, rescue dispensationalism from the perception that it's more about sensationalism than about scholarly study. And according to Wikipedia, dispensationalism peaked in the early 2000s, and then it began to decline in academic Christian circles. And this surprised me to, re- to learn this. In a, a 2009 survey of Southern Baptist seminaries found that they, the Southern Baptist seminaries had abandoned dispensationalism and the flagship seminary of the whole Southern Baptist movement. Southern Baptist is the largest denomination in the United States. And Baptists are very typically historically been uh, dispensational for the past, whatever, hundred years or so. But the flagship Southern Baptist theological seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, has no dispensationalists on his faculty. And uh, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew that dispensationalism was waning in influence, but I didn't realize that Southern Baptists had, like, thoroughly distanced themselves from it. Uh, A political commentator named Kevin Phillips made the statement in 2006 that the 20th century was a century of amplified Darbyism. So just looking back at the, the 1900s, the 20th century, It was a century of amplified Darbyism. It was in the early 1900s, well, 1909, that the Schofield Reference Bible was published. The Niagara Bible Conferences had greased the skids for it to make its way here. And then it just kind of exploded uh, into a huge, huge popular theological movement, which is now uh, dying down somewhat. It is still the view of some of the larger uh, denominations, the Assemblies of God, which is I think the largest Pentecostal denomination is uh, dispensationalist. Uh, Calvary chapels, of course, are dispensationalist. They're the 10th largest, uh, or they're among the 10 largest denominations in the world. So, I mean, there's some, some very strong dispensational influence still in the church. But what is this movement? What is it, uh, what is it that it claims? Okay. Let me talk about the three distinctives of dispensationalism that set it apart from historic Christian theology in general. Uh, The first of these is what we'd call biblical literalism. Now, you might say, well, biblical literalism, isn't that a good thing? I mean, isn't it liberals who don't take the Bible literally? Aren't If you're conservative, doesn't that mean you take the Bible literally? No, it doesn't. If you're conservative, it means you take the Bible seriously. Uh, Taking the Bible seriously and being determined to believe what it's teaching is not the same thing as taking it literally. Yes, some parts of the Bible are to be taken literally. The historical narratives, generally speaking, are written in literal prose. But there's also the Psalms and the Proverbs, which are written in poetry. And poetry has many figures of speech and non-literal aspects to it. And to take them literally would be simply to mistake the kind of literature you're reading. Then you've got you know, apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation and Daniel, if you take that literally, you're going to, you're going to be crazy. I mean, to believe that uh, there's going to be four animals coming out of the sea, a lion, you know, with four wings or whatever, and a bear with, uh, raised up on one side and, and, and a leopard with six wings and a beast with uh, 10 horns. If you believe that's literal animals coming up out of the sea like that, well, then you'll be missing the point because apocalyptic literature like that is not written in a literal genre. And that doesn't mean you don't take it seriously. If you did take it seriously, 
you'd know that you don't take it literally. If you think that Babylon is a lion and is also the head of gold of a statue, and you don't recognize that those are symbols for the Babylonian Empire, then you've got an artificial hermeneutic. You've just decided, I'm just going to impose a literal hermeneutic on every kind of thing in the Bible, no matter how crazy it is to do that. Then you're going to have trouble with something like in Judges chapter 9, where Gideon's son tells a story about the trees going out to make a king for themselves. And they ask these different kings, uh, excuse me, these different trees to be the king of the trees. And each tree answers back that they have no business being king of the trees. They already have something to be doing that's profitable. So why would they give that up to be something ridiculous like king of trees? To talk about the trees talking to each other, you take that literally like that really happened? Of course it didn't happen. It's not intended to be taken as something that really happened. It's a, it's a, it's what we call a fable in that case. There are also parables. Parables are not true stories. They are illustrative stories. The Bible's full of all kinds of literature. And some of it is written in a literal genre, and we should take it literally when it should be taken that way. Other times, the, the most respectful thing to do the Bible is to take it the way it intends to be understood. We have to remember that the Bible is not written to 21st century Western thinkers. It was written to Hebrew people in a land very foreign to us, a culture very foreign to us, in a language that's a dead language now. And frankly, if you went to the Middle East and sought to live there now, even in the 21st century, you'd find culture shock. But you go back 2,000 years ago in the Middle East and try to communicate uh, in a language that's not even in use anymore in the world, and you'd be even in greater culture shock, of course. And so... The task before us when we want to study scripture is to determine what is the scripture trying to say to its original audience, because that's what God was communicating to them. And remember, the Bible wasn't written to us. It's written for our advantage. It's not written to us. It was written to people who lived at the time the authors wrote, and the authors wrote to those people. That's very obvious when you read Paul's letters. He's writing to people that he knew making reference to people in their churches that that they all knew, you know, referring to things going on around them that they all knew about that we don't. When you study those things, you have to realize that you've got to, as much as possible, put yourself in the position of the original readers because they were the ones who were expected to understand it. And if you're reading literal historical narrative, then take it literally. I do. If you're reading something that's poetry, then take it like poetry. If it's a parable, take it as a parable. If it's apocalyptic visions and images, we'll take it that way. That's taking the Bible seriously. When you say, well, I don't care, I don't care how people would have understood in biblical times. I don't even care what the author had in mind. I'm just going to impose this rigid template of literal interpretation on it all because that's how it's comfortable for me to look at it. Well, that's not respecting the Bible. That's deifying your own opinion. Now, the the best way to respect the Bible is to understand each part the way that God and the author expected it to be understood. Uh, But the dispensationalists feel that the high moral ground belongs to those who take everything literally. Now, this is funny because they don't, but they say they do. You see, before dispensationalism arose, that is before the early 1800s, throughout history, the church tended to spiritualize many things, especially in prophecy almost entirely in prophecy, so that there are times when prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel uh, or the minor prophets would say something about Jerusalem or Zion and or Israel, and the church would understand that spiritually to be the spiritual Jerusalem, the spiritual Zion, the spiritual Israel, and therefore the church. And so it was uh, basically the, the norm in biblical interpretation for most of 2,000 years, to recognize that much of these Old Testament prophets, when they spoke about Zion or Jerusalem or Israel, what they were describing things that actually are fulfilled spiritually in the church, which is the spiritual Zion, the spiritual Israel. Now, the New Testament does speak of the church that way, and the New Testament writers do quote Old Testament passages about these subjects, and they apply them to the church. And this is why... Christians through the ages understood that way. But Darby thought this is the mistake. 
that the Christians have been making throughout history is that they've been taking things spiritually that they should have been taking literally. And uh, he said, whenever you read Jerusalem or Israel or those words, it means literal Israel, ethnic Israel, literal physical Jerusalem. And if you if you make it a reference to the church, you're going to go astray. Well, he felt the whole church had gone astray for the past 1800 years before him. But he was uh, he was there to set them straight. And some of you remember Joseph Smith had the same way of looking at things uh, about the same year, about 1830. Darby and Joseph Smith both recovered, they thought, the true understanding of the gospel, which they both said had been lost after the apostles had died. They knew that when the apostles died, the church, the fathers, had not seen it their way. They saw it the way the church has seen it through most of history. But they felt like, yeah, the church has missed the boat, and so we have seen. Now, of course, Darby and Joseph Smith did not have the same view. Darby came up with dispensationalism. Joseph Smith came up with Mormonism. One was in England and one was in America, but they both felt that the whole church had been wrong until they came along and they got it right. And both of them have been extremely successful in influencing people who are not very biblically literate, in my opinion. I'm not saying that all dispensationalists are biblically illiterate. That's not the case. Some are Bible scholars. But the thing is, once you fit your mind with glasses that reads the Bible through a certain grid, it's hard to read it any other way. And most Christians have never read the prophets, or at least never understood them, because they're hard to understand. And, you know, the first teacher that comes along, you can say, well, here's what they're saying. You're going to say, oh, I'm so glad to have someone solve that for me, because I was having a lot of trouble understanding these. And if that teacher is, and usually will be, a dispensationist, because they love to teach about Bible prophecy, and most other views are not quite as obsessed with it, well, then, of course, people are going to be picking up the dispensational grid, reading prophecy through that grid. And that's why even biblically literate people can become dispensationalists because they're literate, but they've read the Bible maybe many, many times through, but they're always looking through the same glasses. And therefore, in many cases, they don't ever get free from their presuppositions that were put upon the text by their teachers. Now, sometimes they do. A lot of dispensationalists or former dispensationalists have read the Bible for themselves and gotten free of it. And of course, others have read the Bible a thousand times. No, no, it's not a thousand times. Let's say a hundred times and have not gotten free of it. And so we can't say, well, it's true because these guys believe it or it's false because these guys disbelieve it. We really have to read the Bible for ourselves, but we have to do so with an open enough mind to recognize that much of what we've been taught might be somebody who are only seeing it that way because that's how it was taught to them. And the people who taught it to them had it taught to them that way and so forth. So it's been passed along, just like the Roman Catholic Church has all its traditions that are passed down through the centuries. Calvinism is that way. And the Calvinism and dispensationalism are not even similar systems. But the thing is that Calvinism, Calvinists believe that that's what the Bible teaches. And no matter how many times they read the Bible, they seem to think it's there. But it's been passed down to them for 500 years by their teachers and the teachers' teachers and the teachers' teachers. And frankly, if you adopt the views I hold, just because I hold them, then you may be the next person to make the mistake of just passing along what someone told you, me, and uh, and not thinking it through. Everybody needs to think about the Bible for themselves, at least before they teach it. You don't have to understand all these things before you can be a Christian or before you can even walk with Jesus. In fact. You could live your whole life and never understand Bible prophecy, as long as you're following Jesus. But if you are going to teach the Bible, you'd certainly better find out whether you're teaching something just because someone taught it to you before, or whether it's really what the Bible teaches. Let me read you some statements by dispensationalists about literal interpretation. Charles Ryrie wrote a book many years ago called Dispensationalism Today. It's still considered to be one of the major um authorities on dispensational teaching. Charles Ryrie was once a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. In his book, Dispensationalism Today, he said on page 86 and 7, dispensationalists claim, he means himself too, dispensationalists claim that their principle of hermeneutics is that of literal interpretation. This means interpretation which gives every word the same meaning it would have in normal usage, whether employed in writing, speaking, or thinking. 
This is sometimes called the principle of grammatical historical interpretation, since the meaning of each word is determined by grammatical and historical considerations. Another dispensational writer who wrote a book on Revelation is Henry Morris. Now, I love Henry Morris. He's from the Creation Science Institute down in San Diego. I believe he's dead now, but he wrote a lot of great books about creation as opposed to evolution. And that was his specialty. And he wrote a book called The Genesis Record, which is quite good, written from a scientific view. But then he wrote one called The Revelation Record, which was his interpretation of Revelation. But he was a dispensationalist, and so he felt that he should be very literal. And here's what he said about his commentary, The Revelation Record. He said, I have tried to follow a strictly literal and sequential approach to the events narrated on the assumption that the best interpretation of a historical record is no interpretation, but simply letting the divine author of the record say what he says and assume he says what he means. Dispensationalists love to say that when they're arguing for a literal interpretation. God says what he means and he means what he says. Well, I agree with that, but he doesn't always say it the way you want him to say it. Henry Morris goes on, he says, the student may well find my commentary to be the most literal approach he has encountered. And that's possibly true. He may have written the most literal commentary on Revelation there is. But let me give you a few things from his commentary. In talking about the four horsemen, when the four seals, the first four seals are broken from the scroll, the four horsemen come. He says this on page 108, in heaven, the symbolism of four great horses and their fearsome riders is employed. On earth, the terrible judgments which they unleash are very literal and real. Now, notice he says the horses are symbolic, and yet he's writing the most literal commentary on Revelation ever written. And he also says on page uh, 112, these horses, of course, are clearly symbolic. There are no horses in heaven. Now, in my book on Revelation, in its first draft, I actually quoted these statements as examples of dispensational literalism. And I had a dispensationalist named Wayne House uh, read it to critique it, and he disagreed with Henry Morris. He thought Henry Morris was not literal enough. When Harry, Henry Morris said, there are no horses in heaven, Wayne House wrote a uh, critique, said, how do we know there's no horses in heaven? So, I mean, he wanted to even be literal about that. You know, when you're reading Revelation and you read about horses running across the sky, a green one and a red one and a black one and a white one, and all these things, to say these are literal horses coming from heaven is going beyond what good hermeneutics requires of us to do. Charles Ryrie himself, who, I, as I said, is the first person I quoted about uh, being literal about things, he said in in his book, The Living End, which is about Revelation, uh, Ryrie said, how do we make sense of all the beasts and thrones and horsemen and huge numbers like 200 million? Answer? take it at face value, unquote. But though he says he takes it at face value, as all dispensationalists claim they do, because after all, God says what he means and means what he says, Ryrie said when he was talking about the uh, locust from the bottomless pit that had tails like scorpions and such in Revelation chapter 9, Ryrie said, John's description sounds very much like some kind of war machine or UFO, unquote. Well, I don't know, maybe those locusts do sound like some kind of war machine or UFO to him. They don't to me, but but the point is, he's suggesting these could be referring to war machines or UFOs, and yet it doesn't say there, it says they're locusts. He's not taking them literally. You see, dispensations don't take things literally either. They take some things literally that other Christians don't. And they claim that they take everything literally, but they don't even notice when they're not doing so. Ryrie, in his commentary on Revelation, the living end, as it's called, in discussing the angel fallen from heaven, says in Revelation that a star, in Revelation 9, a star fell from heaven, and that star is later called the angel of the bottomless pit. And Ryrie says about it in his commentary, sometimes the word star refers to a heavenly body, as in Revelation 8.12. But the word is often used to refer to some kind of intelligent creature, usually an angel. He gives some references. Both meanings are perfectly consistent with plain, normal interpretation. In English, we see this word in the same two ways. Literally, a star means an astronomical entity, and equally literally, though as a figure of speech, we use the word to mean a person, like the star of a football game, unquote. 
Now, see, the problem I have is not that he would say a star doesn't have to literally mean an astronomical body. I agree. I agree. A star is used lots of ways non-literally. But I disagree with him saying he's taking it literally when he's not. If he says a star can mean the uh, the star of a football game, and he says that's equally literal, but using a figure of speech. Now, actually, if you look up the word literal in a dictionary, it says not using figures of speech, <laughs> not metaphorical, and, you know, using the exact meaning. Uh, so dispensations say they're, they're taking things literally, even when they're using fig, uh, see, interpreting things as figures of speech. So in that sense, how are they any different from uh, anyone else who's not a dispensationalist? How is it that the dispensationalists can claim they're taking the literal approach to Scripture and others are not? Here's what uh, John Walford, who once was the chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote in a book called The Millennial Kingdom. Quote, there is a growing realization in theological world that the crux of the millennial issue is the question of the method of interpreting Scripture. Premillenarians follow the so-called grammatical, historical, literal interpretation, while amillenarians, or amillennialists, use the spiritualizing method, unquote. Well, that's not true. I won't read all the quotes today, but you can find plenty of quotes from dispensationalists saying, well, the dispensationalists, well, what they, what they say is this. Non-dispensationalists take many things in the Bible literally, but they don't take prophecy literally. But we dispensationalists, they say, take everything, including prophecy, literally. But of course they don't. And they, and there's many examples of them not doing so. The truth is, and I'll, this is me speaking, all Christians take much of the Bible literally, but all Christians are smart enough to take some things non-literally. When Revelation describes Jesus in Revelation 5, 6 as a lamb that's been slain, having seven eyes and seven horns, this is not a literal description of Jesus. He's compared with a lamb. It's a symbol. The devil is not a literal dragon with seven heads and ten horns. He's a spirit. He's not a dragon. He's not a reptile. He's not a serpent. This is a symbolic way of describing things. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with symbolic ways of describing things. What's wrong is when you do take them symbolically and claim that you are still the only one taking it literally when you're not. And this happens a lot. In fact, dispensationalists take some things non-literally that other people take literally. That's ironic. Because, for example, the 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it talks about a period of 70 sevens or 490 years from one point to another point. There's two historical points mentioned. And between those points, it says it's going to be 490 years. Well, dispensationalists don't think so. They think it was 483 years to the, those points and that the the last seven years was postponed for 2,000 years and hasn't happened yet. And they identify that as a future tribulation. Now, there's nothing in Daniel, not one word in Daniel, that would suggest that there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week. They take it, but it's not in the Bible. No literal interpretation of, of the 70 weeks would tell you that the whole period is not 490 years, but rather 2,490 years once it's all done. Dispensations do this a lot. They add gaps places that the Bible doesn't. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about the image with a head of gold, a chest of silver, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and a stone that hits them in the feet and destroys them. And Daniel tells uh, Nebuchadnezzar that, you know, the, the Babylonian kingdom is the head of gold, the media Persian kingdom is the chest of silver, the Grecian empire is the belly of bronze, the Roman Empire is going to be the legs of iron. And, and the dispensationalists believe all this, but they say, but the feet are not the ancient Roman Empire. The ancient Roman Empire fell in the 5th century AD, and there will be a revived Roman Empire that the Antichrist will rule in the end of time, which has not yet happened. So between the, the ankles and the feet of the image, they find 1,500 years unmentioned. That's not a literal interpretation. That's not taking things literally. They take things literally when they want to, and they don't take things literally when they don't want to. And that's true of virtually everybody. But as far as wanting to or not, the question is, do we have any reason 
for taking some things literally and some things not literally. And, and good biblical studies will answer, yeah, you'd better have a good reason for it. Actually, I pointed out what Walvoord said about how amillennialists take things non-literally. Here's what an amillennialist says about the amillennial way of uh, of hermeneutics. It, it says, uh, this is from uh, William E. Cox in his book, Amillennialism Today. He said, conservative amillenarians interpret the Bible in exactly the same manner claimed to be used by the conservative millenarians or dispensationalists in each of the other schools. All conservative groups, including the futurists and the dispensationalists, claim to use the grammatical historical literal method of interpreting scripture. And that's true. In fact, it's interesting that the grammatical historical interpretation of scripture is sometimes thought to have originated with John Calvin, but he was an millennialist. So, I mean, he was not a dispensationalist. Anyway, this is how they talk. They say that you should believe what they say about prophecy because they're taking it literal. No, they're not. They're not taking it literal. They take some things literal that other people do not, but they take some things non-literally, which really sensible interpretation would take literally. They claim to have the high moral ground in biblical interpretation by taking things literally, but they simply don't. It's just not what happens. They are not literalists consistently, and yet their claim to be is what they think gives them reason to be heard and to be uh, believed. Now, I want to say this. When it comes to Israel, this literal versus non-literal is sort of the crux because Israel in the church is a major distinctive of dispensationalism. So we come to the second major distinctive. The first was literal interpretation. The second is Israel in the church. Now, the reason there's a difference here, as I said, is because historically, most prophecies about Israel in the long distant future from the prophet's time were understood to be fulfilled by Christ and the church. By the historic church, it was understood that the church fulfilled those, or Christ fulfilled them in the church. And the dispensationalists came along and said, no, you need to take Israel to mean Israel and church to mean church, that never the twain shall meet. They believe there's a, a permanent distinction. They believe Israel is God's eternal earthly people. And the church is God's eternal heavenly people. Now, there's absolutely nothing in the scripture to justify this way of talking about, but that's the way dispensationalism sees it. God has two chosen peoples. One of them is Israel, and the other is the church. And never the twain shall meet. They seem to get really awkward when you ask about the apostles who were Jewish. They're part of Israel but they're also the founders of the church and part of the church. Okay, was Paul, was he part of Israel or was he part of the church? Well, don't ask, because the church and Israel, you know, they have no overlap. Basically, they say the church is an idea that wasn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. They say it was a mystery, which uh, was never spoken of in the Old Testament, but that the church was founded after the Jews rejected Christ the church will be removed in the rapture, and then God will deal with Israel again. That's the, that's the view of dispensationalism. That God dealt with Israel until the time of Christ, but when the Jews rejected Christ, he put Israel aside for the time being to deal with the church as a distinct, hermetically sealed off different group of people. And then when he raptures the church, then he'll get back to finishing his business with Israel. And these two have different plans, and they're not the same. And this all has to do of course, with literal versus figurative interpretation. Let me read you something that uh, Ryrie wrote in Dispensationalism Today in pages 94 and 95. He said, new revelation cannot mean contradictory revelation. Later revelation on a subject does not make the earlier revelation mean something different. It may add to or even supersede it, but it does not contradict it. If this were so, then the Bible would be full of contradictions and God would have to be conceived as deceiving the Old Testament prophets when he revealed to them the nationalistic kingdom, since he would have known all the time that he would completely reverse the concept in later revelation. The true concept of progressive revelation is like a building, and certainly the superstructure does not replace the foundation. Now, what's he referring to? He's referring to the fact that the church has historically understood the New Testament 
to be the fuller revelation of God's purpose vis-a-vis the Old Testament. The Old Testament was like a, a beginning uh, revelation, and the New Testament is the fulfillment of it, and that you come to understand the Old Testament only in light of what the New Testament writers say about it. Now, what the dispensations say, that's like saying that God built a house, and in the Old Testament, you know, he built the house, the first story, and then in the New Testament, he he destroyed the first story and built the second story on it. Like the New Testament, something totally new. Michael Brown, who is not a dispensationalist, but he holds dispensational views about Israel, he often likes to say an apostle can't change the meaning of the prophecies with a stroke of the pen. And what he means by that is that Paul actually did understand the prophecies differently than dispensationalists do. And he basically interpreted them in a spiritual way. It's very clear that he did. Whenever you find Paul actually quoting Old Testament prophecies that are relevant to these subjects, he always applies them to the church. But if you look back at the original context of them, they sound like they're about Israel. But Paul believes they're about the church. He believes the church is the spiritual Israel. But Ryrie says, you can't have that happen. God can't say one thing in the Old Testament and then just contradict it in the New. In other words, he's saying if God said he's going to do something to Israel in the Old Testament, he can't just decide not to do that and and do it to the church instead. That's what he's saying. And this is where they come up with the idea of replacement theology. Now, what the church has always believed from the days of the apostles to the present, except for the dispensationalists, they call it replacement theology. Now, replacement theology really has a better, more proper name, and that is supersessionism. Supersessionism teaches that the new covenant has superseded the old covenant. And the old covenant is now kaput. It's now obsolete. The Bible says that because the new covenant has come. So that God doesn't deal with people according to the old covenant anymore, but according to the new covenant. That's supersessionism. But the way the dispensationalist hears that, they hear us saying, the promises God made to Israel are not for Israel anymore. They're for the church. And that being so, the church has replaced Israel. Now, this is not really what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say the church has replaced Israel. What the Bible teaches is that in the Old Testament, Israel was the ecclesia. That's the Greek word for church. In the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word ecclesia was used to refer to Israel. In the New Testament, the word ecclesia was adopted by the apostles and and their followers to refer to the movement that that they were leading. It's the ecclesia. They also called it, Paul called it the true circumcision. Paul called it the true children of Abraham. Peter, writing to the church in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Well, those are all things that God said to Israel in the Old Testament. So. Some people say, oh, it sounds like that somehow the church has replaced Israel in this theology. No, it's not been replaced. Here's what it is. There's a new covenant now. And just as God saved or owned Israel in terms of the old covenant he made at Sinai, Jeremiah said there'd be a new covenant. And Jesus came and made that new covenant with the children of Israel. That is, with the faithful remnant of Israel. And the faithful ones to God, the true Israel of God, came into the new covenant. They're the same people. It's still the people of God. They were Jewish. They were the remnant of Israel. And they called themselves the ecclesia, the church. And there were thousands of them in Jerusalem. I mean, in the opening chapters of Acts, there were multitudes of Jewish people who came to Christ. And they were seen as the true Jewish remnant. And they're the true Israel. And that's why they were called the true circumcision. That's why they're called the true children of Abraham. That's why they're called the heirs of the promise by Paul and others. So the idea is not that the church replaced Israel. It's that the church is the continuation of Israel under a new covenant. The old covenant is no longer relevant, which means that no one can claim any privileges based on the old covenant. It's an old covenant, and Paul likened it in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, to a woman who was married at one point, he says, to the law, or the old covenant, and then her husband dies, and she marries another person. 
makes a new covenant. The same woman is now in a new covenant with a, a new husband. And Paul describes that new husband as one who is risen from the dead, meaning Jesus. So he's saying that the church is the same people who were once married by covenant to the old covenant, but now that covenant is dead. And we're married now to Jesus instead in a new covenant. It's not a different woman. It's the same woman. If, if Jesus had not yet come and you and I were faithful to God, we would have joined Israel as part of the old covenant. However, we were born at a time after a new covenant has come. So we joined them in a new covenant. That is the faithful remnant of Israel. The Messianic Jews were the faithful remnant of Israel and Gentiles were added to them. But, you know, Gentiles were part of them in the Old Testament, too. You could be a Gentile and part of Israel. Ruth and Rahab are good examples of Gentile women who became part of Israel. Anyone could. Any Gentile could be circumcised and become part of Israel, the Bible says, in the Old Testament. And some did, which means Israel in the Old Testament was Jewish and Gentile people who were faithful to the covenant. When the new covenant came, some Jews were faithful to the new covenant and some Gentiles joined them, same as in the old. In both the Old and the New Testament, God's people, Israel, are the people, Jew and Gentile, who have related to God according to whatever covenant is current. In the Old Testament, it was the Sinaitic covenant. Now it's the New Covenant. Now, let me just say this. When they say that, you know, if the Old Testament prophecies aren't going to come to pass the way the Jews thought they were, then God lied or God fooled them or something like that. That's not true. Many people in the Old Testament, of course, did die not knowing how they'd be fulfilled. Paul himself five times, or at least four times, and Peter says it once. Paul says it four times, Peter says it once, says that the the, the church as we know it was a mystery in the Old Testament. It wasn't re, it wasn't made clear. It was not revealed to previous generations. At least Paul says it was revealed to the holy apostles through the Spirit, uh, meaning himself. And that is to say that there were things that that were not made clear in the Old Testament. When Jesus was in the upper room with his uh, disciples, in John 16, verses 12 and 13, he says, I have many things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them yet. When the Spirit comes, he will reveal them to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it's verse 14, Paul says, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned. Well, the Jews were not spiritual people the Old Testament Jews, and they didn't receive it. They didn't understand it. Uh, Jesus didn't bother giving it to them. They couldn't bear it yet. But when the Spirit came, then these things were revealed to the apostles. And that included a revelation of what the prophets were talking about. Second Corinthians 3, verses 14 through 16, says that when the Old Testament prophets are read today, and even when the law is read today by the Jews, There's a veil over their minds because they don't know Christ. That is, they don't understand it. They think they do. They certainly study it. But the way they understand it is not the right way. There's a veil over their hearts. Paul said, when they turn to the Lord, then that veil is taken away. He's saying that a Jewish person who doesn't have Christ is not understanding the Old Testament correctly. It's interesting that in Luke 24, 45, Luke 24, 45, when Jesus rose from the dead, he opened his disciples' understanding, it says, so they'd understand the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. There were no others. So he gave them divine understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Well, why? Couldn't they just study under a rabbi and figure out what they meant? No, the rabbis themselves didn't know. In 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, Peter says, that the Old Testament prophets were curious to know what it was they were talking about. And they inquired of God to know what it was they were talking about. And God told them, it's not for you to know. Peter says that God told them it was for us to know, that is, Christians to know, because God didn't reveal it to them. Now, Peter and Paul and Jesus, they are all saying that what God said in the Old Testament was true, But it was true in a sense that the Jews never have understood it. But now that the Holy Spirit has come and the apostles have shared, well, now we can understand it. And that's why the church has historically spiritualized a great number of things that dispensationalists take literally. Dispensationalists take them the way that the unsaved Jews do. 
They just take them in a literal sense without understanding the Holy Spirit's New Testament revelation about these things. And that's why dispensationalists are in a different place than other Christians are on these matters. Now, so Israel and the church, they believe that God made unconditional promises to Israel. He did not. Now, they're especially concerned about the land promise. Many times God spoke to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob and said that he was giving them the land of the Canaanites. And sometimes he said for an eternal possession. So the, the dispensation, you see, it was eternal. It was eternal. So it's, you know, it, it's still theirs today. No matter what they do, it's eternal. It's unconditional. But it's not unconditional. It never was unconditional. In Leviticus chapter 18, God told Israel that he was so appalled by the behavior of the Canaanites who were in the land before Israel was, that he's causing the land to vomit the Canaanites out of the land. And he's given it to Israel. But he says to Israel there, now, if you do the same things they did, the land will vomit you out too. In other words, you don't have some kind of unconditional lease to this property. I'm giving you this land. But if you're as bad as the previous inhabitants where I'll have you thrown out of it just like they were thrown out of it. In Deuteronomy 28, Moses is telling Israel that all the blessings, including the land that God has promised them, are conditional on them keeping his covenant and obeying his voice. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14, he talks about all the blessings that will come upon them if they obey his covenant. But in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, to the end of the chapter, he says, if you disobey me, don't keep my covenant, all these curses will come upon you. And as you read through it, you'll find that includes they'll be driven out of the land, they'll be brought to nothing, the curses will be on them and on their seed forever, he says. I mean, this conditional. And if he didn't say so there, he says it in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10, God says, whenever I tell a nation that I'm going to destroy them, if they repent of their wickedness, I will repent of the harm I said I would do to them. And whenever I tell a nation that I will build them and bless them and plant them, if they turn around and do evil, I will repent of the good I said I would do to them. In other words, God's saying, I don't make any unconditional promises or threats. If I threaten to destroy a nation because of their wickedness, well, if they turn around, I won't destroy them. If I say I'm going to bless a nation, well, if they turn evil, I'll, I won't bless them. I'll, I'll repent of that. I'll, I'll take away those promises. And that's that's why it's ridiculous to talk about anyone, Israel or anyone else, having unconditional promises given to them uh, of the land or anything else. Now, what they say is, well, if God can can take away his promises to uh, to the Jews, then, well, then he might be able to take away his promises to the Christians. No, he didn't take away his promises to the Jews. He took away his promise to the nation of Israel as a national entity. Many of the Jews were apostates, and they lost out because of that. But there was always a remnant of Jews who were faithful, and they have never been rejected by God. The church is made up of those faithful ones. God will never take away his promises to the faith that he made to the faithful ones. And so, since the church is not like Israel, just comprised of a racial group, it's comprised strictly of people who are faithful, well, there's no danger that promises will be taken away from the faithful. They are for the faithful. So, this distinction between Israel and uh, and the church is a really big sticking point between dispensationalism and other Christians. And it's a much bigger point than I can get into right now. Of course, my lecture series, What Are We to Make of Israel, is all about this. And I'm going to leave it at that because of our time limits. I want to talk about the third thing. And this is what most people are familiar with about dispensationalism. That's the eschatology. Eschatology in dispensationalism differs from historic eschatology on three points. I'm just going to talk about two because of the time limits we have right now. One of them is in their premillennialism. Now, premillennialism is the view that Jesus will come back and establish a millennial kingdom on this earth for a thousand years, 
before the new heavens and new earth. So that when Jesus comes, what we have is not the new heavens and earth, but we have the millennial kingdom, and he'll be reigning on earth during that time. This kingdom is described in Revelation chapter 20. Now, the amillennial view, which was held by the church most of history, holds that the thousand years in Revelation 20 is symbolic, simply meaning a long period of time. And again, if you want more details on this from my lectures, my lectures on when shall these things be, the series called When Shall These Things Be, will go into this in great detail. I can't now. The point I would make, though, is that dispensationalists, they were not the first premillennialists. There were premillennialists in the early church. In fact, for the first three centuries, it may have been the most dominant view of the early church. There were other views in the early church besides premillennialism, but there were plenty of respectable premillennialists, but they were not dispensationalists. For one thing, they were premillennialists because they believed that Revelation 20 is talking about something that would happen after Jesus came back. But the dispensationalists revived premillennialism, which had kind of fallen out of favor for 1,500 years. Darby brought it back in, and he believed the millennium will be a return to Judaism. That is, the temple will be rebuilt in the millennium. Animal sacrifices will be offered in the millennium. The Levitical priesthood will be reestablished in the millennium. It's going to be just like a return to the old covenant, except they say the old covenant sacrifices looked forward to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The millennial sacrifices will look back on the sacrifice of Christ as a memorial. But this addition of Jewish practices to the millennium was not part of the premillennialism of the early church when they were premillennial. Uh, they didn't hold these dispensational ideas. Uh, Darby thought there'd be a restoration of these things, and there can't be, of course, because Jesus was the final sacrifice. He put an end to animal sacrifices. His blood uh, it was shed once and for all, the Bible says, and then you're not going to be more sacrifices after that. So the premillennialism is part of it, but a special brand of it. The church fathers who were premillennial were called, his, we call their view historic premillennialism. And their view is very much like amillennialism in most respects, except they believe there'd be a future millennium. But they weren't dispensational in other respects. But the restoration of premillennialism in dispensational theology was an important eschatological point. But more pronounced and more talked about is their view of the pre-tribulational rapture. The idea that the 70th week of Daniel has been postponed till the end of the age and the 70th week of Daniel is, as they would say, of course, seven years long, and it is the tribulation period. And they believe that the church is to be removed from the earth before this seven-year tribulation takes place. Not entirely uh, unfamiliar, probably, if you've heard any teaching on eschatology. It's the most popular view today in America that Jesus is going to rapture the church before the tribulation. I think its popularity is not based on its exegetical superiority, but largely because it's wishful thinking. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily teach there is a future seven-year tribulation. There's no mention of it. If the 70th week of Daniel is not it, and I don't believe it is, then there's nothing in the Bible to suggest a seven-year tribulation at all. Jesus said there would be tribulation, but he didn't say it would be seven years. There's even tribulation mentioned in the book of Revelation, but it's not said to be seven years either. There's no mention of a seven-year tribulation anywhere in the Bible. But the idea that the last seven years before Jesus returns will be a seven-year tribulation, and that's when the Antichrist will rise, and that's when all kinds of things will happen that you've heard are supposed to happen in the end times, because dispensationalism always teaches these things. They say before any of that happens, the church will be taken to safety in heaven, so we'll miss the tribulation. And then we'll come back with Jesus at the end of the tribulation to set up the millennial kingdom. Now, this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture, apparently there were some people before Darby who taught such things. It was not the predominant view of the church, but there are some church fathers, not very early ones necessarily, but some church fathers from before Darby's time and, and some Puritan writers and some others before Darby who seemed to believe that Jesus might take the church out of the earth before the wicked are taken out so at some interval. Some thought it would be a three-and-a-half-year interval, and some thought it would be a different interval. But the point is, the idea that there would be a coming for the church before the actual second coming of Christ did not originate entirely with Darby. 
but it was incorporated into his system. And it was the first time that this became, as the dispensational system became very dominant and very popular, that's when the preterb rapture became as popular and dominant as it became. Now, let me just say this. When I was a dispensationalist, I believed that there were about 20 verses in the Bible that taught a preterb rapture. I won't go through them all right now because it's too time consuming, but I do have lectures on this in my series online at thenarrowpath.com. My series called When Shall These Things Be? has detailed treatment of this subject, including all the references that I would have used in the early days of my ministry to prove the preterb rapture. However, what I found as years went by and I looked at those verses, I realized that none of them actually say anything about a preterb rapture. What they did do is allow me to believe in a preterb rapture if I assumed it was so. If I assumed there was one, I could see those verses in light of it and I could interpret them in light of it. But there was nothing in those verses that would have provided that doctrine. It is not taught. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks of a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, there's a rapture, certainly. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, talks about the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. Uh, Paul talks about this also in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, around verse uh, 51 and, and thereabouts. He says, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep. He means die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we, sh- you know, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall rise, and we will be changed. Those two passages, First Thessalonians 4 and First Corinthians 15, are the two passages in the Bible that talk about the rapture distinctly, but neither of them say anything about the tribulation being uh, before, after, or in the middle, or, or, or around it. There's, there's no connection in any passage between a rapture and a tribulation. In other words, you won't find a passage that takes a post-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, a pre-tribulation rapture. You will find no passage about that talks about tribulation and rapture in the same place. And therefore, there just isn't any place that teaches that. Now, there are some things that teach that it isn't so. And, you know, what really sealed uh, the deal for me after I began to realize that all my proof texts for the rapture, for the pre-trib rapture, uh, were flawed and they didn't actually say anything about it was when I saw what the Bible actually specifically does say about the rapture. And that's especially in Jesus words in John six, verse 39, verse 40, verse 44 and verse 54. That's John six, 39, 40, 44 and 54. All four of those verses in John six. Jesus says he's going to raise his people up, that's the church, on the last day. Now, if he thought the last day would be followed by another seven-year tribulation and that the last day was not really the last day, he should have used a different term than that because the last day, when given no other explanation, means the day after which are no other days. And Jesus also made it clear that's when the wicked will be judged too. In John 12, I think it's verse 48... I think it's 48. He says that the, those who reject his words will be judged on the last day. So the righteous will be raised on the last day. The wicked will be judged on the last day, the last day. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31, that when he comes back, he's going to call all the nations before him. And then he's going to separate between the sheep and the goats. All the sheep and the goats are going to be raised at the same time and come to judgment, according to Matthew 25, 31. This is the teaching of scripture. There's nothing in the Bible that says a different thing about it. And therefore, it became clear that while the Bible nowhere said the rapture would happen anywhere prior to the last day, uh, it repeatedly says it will happen on the last day. And therefore, the uh, pre-trib rapture does not really have a biblical leg to stand on. Now, there are arguments that people make for it, and some of them are more emotional than biblical. I've heard people say, Well, Jesus would never allow his beloved bride to go through the horrors of tribulation. When I hear this, I always think, read a little bit of church history. Uh, If you think that God would not allow his church to go through horrible trials and persecutions, then you'd know nothing, A, about church history, and B, 
about what the church is going through today in many parts of the world. We are so insulated in America. We've never had people, you know, torturing us here for our faith. But that's been standard treatment of Christians throughout history in many, many parts of the world. Frankly, whatever the dispensations think is going to happen in the tribulation, whatever they think the Antichrist is going to do to them, uh, to the people in the tribulation, the worst things have been done already to Christians in many parts of the world in history. So this whole idea that, you know, God would never allow the church to go through tribulation is simply being clueless about reality, about history, about even what's going on in the world today in places where we don't live. So this millennium with the temple and the animal sacrifices and so forth, that was a distinctive of Darby's eschatology. And the pre-tribulation rapture is pretty much a distinctive of his eschatology. So dis- dispensationalism had a distinctive eschatology. Of course, it takes the book of Revelation in a futuristic way. Uh, they believe that the rapture occurs in Revelation 4.1 and that the rest of the book is about the tribulation and the millennium. Now, you know, Revelation 4.1 does say that John heard a voice like a trumpet saying, come up hither and I will show you things that are to happen after this, and then he's caught up into heaven. And they say, see, that that represents the church being caught up into heaven. Well, who says it does? John doesn't say that it does. There's nothing in the Bible that suggests that what John does, the church does. And if it is so, then what do you do when John's back on earth again in chapter 17? And he's carried out to a wilderness place, and he sees the woman riding on the beast. I mean, John isn't always going to be in heaven after this. To say that John being caught up to heaven represents the rapture of the church is simply to make something up out of whole cloth and to ignore the fact that John's movements in Revelation do not correspond with those of the church. Dispensationalists, I have to say, are not very good Bible exegetes. And the reason is they say they have to take everything literally, but of course they don't any more than anyone else does. But what they do is impose a particular grid of their own on the whole Bible, and they read through that grid and I think the reason dispensationalism becomes has become as popular as it has is because most Christians in the past century have been largely illiterate of the Bible. They simply haven't read the Bible enough, and if they have, they haven't read it thoughtfully and critically. They've been willing to look at the commentators, the study Bibles, the popular movies about eschatology, and they just assume that this must be you know what the Bible's talking about. Frankly, I, I'll tell you the truth, I find it very frustrating that So many Christians just do not bother to think critically about these things. You don't have to agree with me. If if you agree with me now because of listening to this lecture, then you're not thinking critically either. You've just heard another side. What you need to do is study the Bible and think critically about it. I will say this as I'm closing because we are out of time, that my lectures at our website, of course, as you know, if you've been to the website, they're free. There's It doesn't cost anything. But if you go to the topical lectures, Go to thenarrowpath.com under topical lectures. You'll find a series called When Shall These Things Be? You'll also find the series, What Are We to Make of Israel? Both of these go in great detail into things we've just skipped over very lightly today. And, um, and that's all we can do is skip over it very lightly today. Mm-hmm.